Chapter 3 of The Art of Travel Recording by Mike Warboys The Art of Travel by Sir Francis Galton Chapter 3 Outfit It is impossible to include lists of outfit in any reasonable space that shall suit the various requirements of men engaged in expeditions of different magnitudes, who adopt different modes of locomotion, and who visit different countries and climates. I have therefore thought it best to describe only one outfit as a specimen, selecting for my example the Desiderata for South Africa. In that country the traveller has, or had a few years ago, to take everything with him, for there were no civilised settlers, and the natural products of the country are of as little value in supplying his wants as those of any country can be. Again, South African wants are typical of those likely to be felt in every part of a large proportion of the region where rude travel is likely to be experienced, as in North Africa, in Australia, in southern Siberia, and even in the prairies and pampas of North and South America. To make such an expedition effective, all the articles included in the following lists may be considered as essential. I trust, on the other hand, that no article of real importance is omitted. Stores for general use. These are to a great degree independent of the duration of the journey. Small stores various. One or two very small, soft steel axes, a small file to sharpen them, a few additional tools, see chapter on timber, spare butcher's knives, eight pounds, a dozen awls for wood and for leather, two of them in handles, two gimlets, a dozen sail needles, three palms, a ball of sewing twine, bit of beeswax, sewing needles, assorted, a ball of black and white thread, buttons, two tailor's thimbles, see chapter on cord, string and thread, three pounds, two pen knives, small metal saw, bit of turkey bone, large scissors, corkscrew, one and a half pounds, spring balances from a quarter of a pound to five pounds and from one pound to fifty pounds, or else a hand steelyard one and a half pounds, fish hooks of many sorts, cobbler's wax, black silk, gut, two or more fishing lines and floats, a large ball of line, thin brass wire for springs, see chapters on fishing and trapping, two pounds, ball of wicks for lamps, candle mould, see chapter on candles, a few corks, lump of sulphur, Amado, see chapter on fire, one and a half pounds. Medicines, see chapter on medicine, a blunt pointed bistory and good forceps for thorns, one pound. A small iron and an ironing flannel, clothes brush, bottle of benzene or other scouring drops, three pounds. Bullet mould, not a heavy one bit of iron plate for a ladle, gun-cleaning apparatus, turn-screws, nipple-wrench, bottle of fine oil, spare nipples, spare screw for cock, see chapter on gun fittings, two and a half pounds, two Macintosh water bags, shaped for the pack saddle, of one gallon each, with funnel-shaped necks and having a wide mouth, empty, see chapter on water for drinking, two and a half pounds, Composition for mending them in two small bottles and a spare piece of Macintosh, half a pound. Spare leather, canvas and webbing for girths, rings and buckles, twenty pounds. Two small patrol tents, poles and pegs, see chapter on tents, thirty pounds. Small inflatable pontoon to hold one or even two men. See chapter on rafts and boats, ten pounds. Small bags for packing the various articles independently of the saddle bags, four pounds. 
Macintosh sheeting overall to keep the pack dry, four pounds. Total weight of various small stores, 95 pounds. Heavy stores, various. Pack saddles, spare saddlery, see chapter on harness. Bag for packing. Water vessels, see chapter on water for drinking. Heavy ammunition for sporting purposes. One pound weight gives ten shots, otherwise each armed man is supposed to carry a long double-barrelled rifle of very small bore, say of seventy, and ammunition for these is allowed for below. Total weight of various heavy stores, not given. Stationery. Two ledgers, a dozen notebooks, see chapter on memoranda and log books, paper. Nine pounds. Ink, pens, pencils, sealing wax, gum. Two and a half pounds. Board to write upon. Two pounds. Books to read, say equal to six volumes, the ordinary size of novels, and maps. Seven and a half pounds. Bags and cases, three pounds. Sketching books, colours and pencils, six pounds. Total weight of stationery, thirty pounds. Mapping. Two sextants, horizon and roof, lantern, two pints of oil, azimuth compass, small aneroid, thermometers, tin pot for boiling thermometers, watches. See chapter on surveying instruments. Eighteen pounds. Protractors, rulers, compasses, measuring tape, etc. Three pounds. Raper's navigation, nautical almanac, Carr's Synopsis, published by Wheel, Small Tables and Small Almanacs, Star Maps, four pounds, Bags and Baskets, well wadded, six pounds, Total weight of mapping materials, thirty one pounds, Natural History for an occasional collector, Arsenical Soap, two pounds, Camphor, half a pound, pepper, half a pound, bag of some powder to absorb blood, two pounds, toe and cotton, about ten pounds, scalpel, forceps, scissors, etc., half a pound, sheet brass, stamped for labels, half a pound, sixteen pounds. Pill boxes, cork, insect boxes, pins, tin for catching and keeping and killing animals, nets for butterflies, see, bags and all, Ten pounds. Geological hammers, lenses, clinometer, etc. Four pounds. Specimens. I make no allowance for the weight of these, for they accumulate as stores are used up, and the total weight is seldom increased. Total weight of natural history materials, for an occasional collector, thirty pounds. Stores for individual use. For each white man, independently of duration of journey. Clothes, Macintosh rug, ditto sheet, blanket bag, spare blanket, thirty pounds. Share of plates, knives, forks, spoons, pannikins or bowls, two pounds. Share of cooking things, iron pots, coffee mill, kettles, etc., three pounds. Spare knife, flints, steel, tinderbox, tinder, four pipes, two pounds. Bags, six pounds. Provisions for emergency, five days of jerked meat at three pounds a day, on average, a fifteen pounds. Two quarts of water, on average, four pounds. Share of kegs, one and a half pounds, eight pounds. Total for each white man, sixty-six pounds. For each white man and for each six months, tea and coffee, nine pounds, Tobacco, six pounds. Salt, six pounds. Pepper, one pound. Twenty-two pounds. Brandy or rum, occasionally served out, six pounds. White sugar, two pounds. Arrowroot, one pound. Dried onions, etc., three pounds. Six pounds. Ammunition for small board rifles with reserve powder and caps, nine pounds. Total for six months, or at the rate of seven pounds per month, 43 pounds. 
for each black man, independently of duration of journey, bedding, etc., nine pounds, meat and water for emergencies, as above, about, nineteen pounds, share of cooking things, two pounds, total for each black man, thirty pounds. For each black man and for each six months, tobacco, six pounds, salt, pepper, etc., five pounds, eleven pounds. Presents, which will have to be made him from time to time, six pounds. Total for six months, seventeen pounds, or at the rate of three pounds per month. Presents and articles for payment. It is of the utmost importance to a traveller to be well and judiciously supplied with these. They are his money, and without money a person can have no more travel in savagedom than in Christendom. It is a great mistake to suppose that savages will give their labour or cattle in return for anything that is bright or new. They have their real wants and their fashions as much as we have, and, unless what a traveller brings, meets either the one or the other. He can get nothing from them, except through fear or compulsion. The necessities of a savage are soon satisfied, and, unless he belongs to a nation civilized enough to live in permanent habitations and secure from plunder, he cannot accumulate, but is only able to keep what he actually is able to carry about his own person. Thus, the chief at Lake Ngami told Mr. Anderson that his beads would be of little use for the women about the place already, quotes, grunted like pigs, unquote, under the burdens of those that they wore, and which they had received from previous travellers. These are matters of serious consideration to persons who propose to travel with a large party and who must have proportionately large wants. Speaking of presents and articles for payment, as of money, it is essential to have a great quantity and variety of small change, wherewith the traveller can pay for small services, for carrying messages, for draughts of milk, pieces of meat, etc. Beads, shells, tobacco, needles, awls, cotton caps, handkerchiefs, clasp knives, small axes, spear and arrowheads generally answer this purpose. There is infinite fastidiousness shown by savages in selecting beads, which, indeed, are their jewellery. So valuable beads, taken at haphazard, are much more likely to prove failures than not. It all would always be well to take abundance — forty or fifty pounds weight goes but a little way — of the following cheap beads, as they are very generally accepted. Dull white, dark blue, and vermilion red, all of a small size. It is the ignorance of what are the received articles of payment in a distant country, and the using up of those that are taken, which, more than any other cause, limits the journeyings of an explorer. The demands of each fresh chief are an immense drain upon his store. Summary to know the minimum weight for which a proposed expedition must find means of transport, the omitted figures must be supplied in the following schedule, the others must be corrected where required, and the whole must be added together. Stores for general use Various small stores, £95. Various heavy stores, not given. Stationery, 30 Mapping, 31 Natural history, occasional, 30. For each white man, at rate of £7 per month, 66. For each black man, at rate of £3 per month, 30. Presents and articles of payment are usually of far greater weight than all the above things put together. Total weight to be carried by expedition, 282. Mem. If meat and bread and the like have to be carried, a very large addition of weight must be made to this list, for the weight of a daily ration varies from three pounds, or even four pounds, to two pounds, according to the concentration of nutriment in the food that is used. 
slaughter animals carry themselves, but the cattle watchers swell the list of those who have to be fed. Means of transport In order to transport the articles belonging to an expedition across a wild and unknown country, we may estimate as follows. Beasts of burthen An ass will not usually care more than about net weight 65 pounds, a small mule 90, a horse 100, an ox of an average greed 120, a camel which rarely can be used by an explorer 300 pounds, a light cart exclusive of the driver should not carry more than 800, a light wagon such as one or two horses would trot away with along a turnpike lane not more than 1,500, a wagon of the strongest construction, not more than 3,000. Weight of rations. A fair estimate in commissariat matters is as follows. A strong wagon full of food carries a thousand full day rations. The pack of an ox, 40. The pack of a horse, 30. A slaughter of ox yields as fresh meat, 80. A fat sheep yields 10. Note well, meat when jerk loses about one half of its nourishing powers. It is very inconvenient to take more than six pack animals in a caravan that has to pass over broken country, for so much time is lost by the whole party in readjusting the packs of each member of it, whenever one gets loose, that its progress is seriously retarded. Carriages. An animal, camels always excepted, draws upon wheels in a wild country about two and a half times the weight he can carry. End of chapter three. Recording by Mike Warboys, Orono, Maine. Chapter Four of The Art of Travel, recording by Anna Simon, The Art of Travel by Sir Francis Galton. Chapter Four, Medicine. General remarks: Travellers are apt to expect too much from their medicines and to think that savages will hail them as demigods wherever they go, but their patients are generally cripples who want to be made whole in a moment and other such like impracticable cases. Powerful emetics. Purgatives and eye washes are the most popular physickings. The traveller who is sick away from help may console himself with the proverb that, though there is a great difference between a good physician and a bad one, there is very little between a good one and none at all. Drugs and Instruments Outfit of Medicines A traveller, unless he be a professed physician, has no object in taking a large assortment of drugs. He wants a few powders, ready prepared which a physician, who knows the diseases of the country in which he is about to travel, will prescribe for him. Those in general use are as follows. 1. Emetic, mild. 2. Ditto, very powerful, for poison. Sulvate of zinc, also used as an eyewash in ophthalmia. 3. Aperient, mild. 4. Ditto, powerful. 5. Cordial, for diarrhea. 6. Quinine, for egg. 7. Sudorific, Dover's powder. 8. Chlorodyne. 9. Camphor. 10. Carbolic acid. In addition to these powders, the traveller will want Warburg's fever drops, glycerine or cold cream, mustard paper for blistering, heartburn lozenges, lint, a small roll of diacylon, lunar caustic and a proper holder to touch old sores with and for snake bites, a scalpel and a blunt-pointed bistory, with which to open abscesses. The blades of these should be waxed to keep them from rust. A good pair of forceps to pull out thorns, a couple of needles to sew up gashes, waxed thread, or better, silver wire. A mild effervescing aperient, like moxins, is very convenient. Seidlitz powders are perhaps a little too strong for frequent use in a tropical climate. How to carry medicines the medicines should be kept in zinc pill-boxes with a few letters punched both on their tops and bottoms to indicate what they contain, as E-M-E-T, A-S-T-R, etc. 
it is more important that the bottoms of the boxes should be labelled than their tops, because when two of them have been opened at the same time, it often happens that the tops run a risk of being changed. It will save continual trouble with weights and scales if the powders be so diluted with flour that one measureful of each shall be a full average dose for an adult, and if the measure to which they are adopted be cylindrical, and of such a size as just to admit a common lead pencil, and of a determined length, it can at any time be replaced by twisting up a paper cartridge. I would further suggest that the powders be differently coloured, one colour being used for emetics and another for appearance. Lint, to make. Scrape a piece of linen with a knife. Ointment. Simple serret, which is spread on lint as a soothing plaster for sores, consists of equal parts of oil and wax, but lard may be used as a substitute for the wax. Seidlitz powders are not often to be procured in the form we are accustomed to take them in, in England, so a recipe for making twelve sets of them is annexed. One and a half ounce of carbonate of soda and three ounces of tartarized soda for the blue papers, seven drachms of tartaric acid for the white papers. Bush Remedies Emetics For want of proper physic, drink a charge of gunpowder in a tumble full of warm water of soap suds and tickle the throat. Vapor baths are used in many countries, and the following plan used in Russia is often the most convenient. Heat stones in the fire and put them on the ground in the middle of the cabin or tent. On these pour a little water, and clouds of vapor are given off. In other parts of the world branches are spread on hot wood embers, and the patient is placed upon these, wrapped in a large cloth. Water is then sprinkled on the embers, and the patient is soon covered with a cloud of vapor. The traveller who is chilled or overworked, and has a day of rest before him, would do well to practice this simple and pleasant remedy. Bleeding and cupping. Physicians say, nowadays, that bleeding is rarely, if ever, required, and that frequently it does much harm. But they used to bleed for everything. Many savages know how to cup. They commonly use a piece of a horn as the cup, and they either suck at a hole in the top of the horn to produce the necessary vacuum, or they make a blaze as we do, but with a wisp of grass. Illnesses Fevers of all kinds, diarrhoea and rheumatism, are the plagues that most afflict travellers. Ophthalmia often threatens them. Change of air, from the flat country up into the hills, as soon as the first violence of the illness is past, works wonders in hastening and perfecting a cure. Fever The number of travellers that have fallen victims to fever in certain lands is terrible. It is a matter of serious consideration whether any motives, short of imperious duty, justify a person in braving a fever-stricken country. In the ill-fated Niger expedition, three vessels were employed, of which the Albert stayed the longest time in the river, namely two months and two days. Her English crew consisted of sixty-two men. Of these, fifty-five caught fever in the river, and twenty-three died. Of the remaining seven, only two ultimately escaped scot-free, the others suffering, more or less severely, on their return to England. In Dr. McWilliams's medical history of this expedition, it is laid down that the Niger fever, which may be considered as a type of pestilential fever generally, usually sets in sixteen days after exposure to the malaria, and that one attack, instead of acclimatizing the patient, seems to render him all the more liable to a second. Every conceivable precaution known in those days had been taken to ensure the health of the crew of the Albert. A great discovery of modern days is the power of quinine to keep off many types of fever. A person would, now, have little to fear in taking a passage in a Niger steamer, supposing that vessels ran regularly up that river. The quinine he would take, beginning at the coast, would render him proof against fever until he had passed the delta, but nothing would remove the risk of a long sojourn in the delta itself. However, I should add that Dr. Livingstone's experience on the Zambezi throws doubt on the power of quinine to keep off the type of fever that prevails upon that river. Precautions in unhealthy places There are certain precautions which should be borne in mind in unhealthy places, besides that which I have just mentioned of regularly taking small doses of quinine, such as never to encamp to the leeward of a marsh, to sleep close in between large fires with a handkerchief gathered round your face. Natural instinct will teach this. To avoid starting too early in the morning, 
and to beware of unnecessary hunger, hardship, and exposure. It is a widely corroborated fact that the banks of a river and adjacent plains are often less affected by malaria than the low hills that overlook them. Diarrhea With a bad diarrhea, take nothing but broth, rice water, and it may be rice in very small quantities at a meal until you are quite restored. The least piece of bread or meat causes an immediate relapse. Ophthalmia Sulphate of zinc is invaluable as an eye-wash. For ophthalmia is a scourge in parts of North and South Africa, in Australia, and in many other countries. The taste of the solution, which should be strongly astringent, is the best guide to its strength. Toothache Tough diet tries the teeth so severely that a man about to undergo it should pay a visit to a dentist before he leaves England. An unskilled traveller is very likely to make a bad job of a first attempt at tooth drawing. By constantly pushing and pulling at an aching tooth, it will in time loosen and perhaps, after some weeks, come out. Thirst. Pour water over the clothes of the patient and keep them constantly wet. Restrain his drinking after the first few minutes, as strictly as you can summon heart to do it. See thirst in the chapter on water. In less severe cases, drink water with a teaspoon. It will satisfy a part of the palate as much as if you gulped it down in tumblerfuls, and will disorder the digestion very considerably less. Hunger. Give two or three mouthfuls every quarter of an hour to a man reduced to the last extremity by hunger. Strong broth is the best food for him poisoning. The first thing is to give a powerful emetic, that whatever poison still remains unabsorbed in the stomach may be thrown up. Use soapsets or gunpowder, see emetics, if proper emetics are not at hand. If there be violent pains and gripings, or retchings, give plenty of water to make the vomitings more easy. Next, do your best to combat the symptoms that are caused by the poison which was absorbed before the emetic acted. Thus, if the man's feet are cold and numbed, put hot stones against them, and wrap them up warmly. If he be drowsy, heavy, and stupid, give brandy and strong coffee, and try to rouse him. There is nothing more to be done, save to avoid doing mischief. Fleas Italian flea powder sold in the East is really efficacious. It is the powdered peyote, or flea bane, mentioned in Curzon's Armenia, as growing in that country. It has since become an important article of export. A correspondent writes to me, quote, I have often found a light cotton or linen bag a great safeguard against the effects of fleas. I used to creep into it, draw the loop tight round my neck, and was thus able to set legions of them at defiance. End quote. Vermin on the Person I quote the following extract from Huck's Travels in Tartary. Quote, we had now been travelling for nearly six weeks, and still wore the same clothing we had assumed on our departure. The incessant pricklings with which we were harassed sufficiently indicated that our attire was peopled with the filthy vermin to which the Chinese and Tartars are familiarly accustomed, but which, with the Europeans, are objects of horror and disgust. Before quitting Tashankurn, we had bought in a chemist's shop a few sepoks worth of mercury, we now made with it a prompt and specific remedy against the lice. We had formerly caught the receipt from some Chinese, and, as it may be useful to others, we think it right to describe it here. You take half an ounce of mercury, which you mix with old tea leaves, previously reduced to paste by mastication. To render this softer, you generally add saliva. Water could not have the same effect. You must afterwards bruise and stir it a while, so that the mercury may be divided into little balls as fine as dust. I presume the blue pill is a pretty exact equivalent to this preparation. You infuse this composition into a string of cotton, loosely twisted, which you hang round the neck. The lice are sure to bite at the bait, and they thereupon as surely swell, become red, and die forthwith. In China and in Tartary you have to renew this salutary necklace once a month. Blissed Feet to prevent the feet from blistering, it is a good plan to soak the inside of the stocking before setting out, making a thick leather all over it. A raw egg broken into a boot before putting it on greatly softens the leather. Of course the boot should be well greased when hard walking is anticipated. After some hours on the road, when the feet are beginning to be chafed, take off the shoes and change the stockings, putting what was the right stocking on the left foot and the left stocking on the right foot. 
or, if one foot only hurts, take off the boot and turn the stocking inside out. These were the plans adopted by Captain Barclay when a blister was formed. Quote, Rub the feet on going to bed with spirits mixed with tallow dropped from a candle into the palm of the hand. On the following morning no blister will exist. The spirits seem to possess the healing power, the tallow serving only to keep the skin soft and pliant. This is Captain Cochrane's advice, and the remedy was used by him in his pedestrian tour. End quote. Murray's Handbook of Switzerland. The recipe is an excellent one. Pedestrians and teachers of gymnastics all endorse it. Rarefied air, effects of. On high plateau or mountains, newcomers must expect to suffer. The symptoms are described by many South American travellers. The attack of them is there, among other names, called the puna. The disorder is sometimes fatal to stout plethoric people. Oddly enough, cats are unable to endure it. At villages 13,000 feet above the sea, Dr. Chudy says that they cannot live. Numerous trials have been made with these unhappy feline barometers, and the creatures have been found to die in frightful convulsions. The symptoms of the puna are giddiness, dimness of sight and hearing, headaches, fainting fits, blood from mouth, eyes, nose, lips, and a feeling like seasickness. Nothing but time cures it. It begins to be felt severely at from 12,000 to 13,000 feet above the sea. M. Hermann Schlagentweit, who has had a great deal of mountain experience in the Alps and in the Himalayas, up to the height of 20,000 feet or more, tells me that he found the headache, etc., come on when there was a breeze far more than at any other time. His whole party would wake at the same moment and begin to complain of the symptoms immediately on the commencement of a breeze. The symptoms of overwork are not wholly unlike those of the puna, and many young travellers who have felt the first have ascribed them to the second. Scurvy has attacked travellers even in Australia, and I have myself felt symptoms of it in Africa when living wholly on meat. Any vegetable diet cures it. Lime juice, treacle, raw potatoes, and acid fruits are especially efficacious. Dr. Kane insists on the value of entirely raw meat as a certain antiscorbutic. This is generally used by the Eskimo. Hemorrhage from a wound. When the blood does not pour or trickle in a steady stream from a deep wound, but jets forth in pulses, and is of a bright red color, all the bandages in the world will not stop it. It is an artery that is wounded, and, unless there be some one accessible who knows how to take it up and tie it, I suppose that the method of our forefathers is the only one that can be used, as you would for a snake-bite see next paragraph, or else to pour boiling grease into the wound. This is, of course, a barbarous treatment, and its success is uncertain, as the cauterized artery may break out afresh. Still, life is in question, and it is the only hope of saving it. After the cautery, the wounded limb should be kept perfectly still, well raised and cool, until the wound is nearly healed. A tourniquet, which will stop the blood for a time, is made by tying a strong thong, or string, or handkerchief firmly above the part, putting a stick through, and screwing it tight. If you know whereabouts the artery lies, which is the object to compress, put a stone over the place under the handkerchief. The main arteries follow pretty much the direction of the inner seams of the sleeves and trousers. Snake Bites Tie a string tight above the part, suck the wound, and caustic it as soon as you can. Or, for want of a caustic, explode gunpowder in the wound, or else do what Mr. Mansfield Parkins well suggests, that is, cut away with a knife, and afterwards burn out with the end of your iron ramrod, heated as near a white heat as you can readily get it. The arteries lie deep, and as much flesh may, without much danger, be cut or burned into, as the fingers can pinch up. The next step is to use the utmost energy, and even cruelty, to prevent the patient's giving way to that lethargy and drowsiness which is the usual effect of snake poison, and too often ends in death. Wasp and Scorpion Stings The oil scraped out of a tobacco pipe is a good application. Should the scorpion be large, his sting must be treated like a snake bite. Broken Bones it is extremely improbable that a man should die in consequence of a broken leg or arm if the skin be uninjured, but if the broken end forces its way through the flesh, the injury is a very serious one. Abscesses form, 
the parts mortify, and the severest consequences often follow. Hence, when a man breaks a bone, do not convert a simple injury into a severe one by carrying him carelessly. If possible, move the encampment to the injured man, and not vice versa. Mr. Druitt says, quote, When a man has broken his leg, lay him on the other side, put the broken limb exactly on the sound one, with a little straw between them, and tie the two legs together with handkerchiefs. Thus the two legs will move as one, and the broken bone will not hurt the flesh so much, nor yet come through the skin. End quote. Drowning A half-drowned man must be put to bed in dry heated clothes, hot stones, etc., placed against his feet, and his head must be raised moderately. Human warmth is excellent, such as that of two big men made to lie close up against him, one on each side. All rough treatment is not only ridiculous but full of harm such as the fashion, which still exists in some places, of hanging up the body by the feet, that the swallowed water may drain out of the mouth. I reprint here the instructions circulated by Dr. Marshall Hall. 1. Treat the patient instantly, on the spot, in the open air, exposing the face and chest to the breeze, except in severe weather. To clear the throat, 2. Place the patient gently on the face, with one wrist under the forehead, all fluids and the tongue itself then fall forwards, leaving the entrance into the windpipe free. If there be breathing, wait and watch. If not, or if it fail, to excite respiration. 3. Turn the patient well and instantly on his side, and 4. Excite the nostrils with snuff, the throat with a feather, etc. Dash cold water on the face previously wrapped warm. If there be no success, lose not a moment, but instantly to imitate respiration, 5. Replace the patient on his face, raising and supporting the chest well on a folded coat or other article of dress. 6. Turn the body very gently on the side and a little beyond, and then briskly on the face, alternately, repeating these measures deliberately, efficiently, and perseveringly fifteen times in the minute, occasionally varying the side. When the patient reposes on the chest, this cavity is compressed by the weight of the body, and expiration takes place. When he is turned on the side, this pressure is removed, and inspiration occurs. 7. When the prone position is resumed, make equable but efficient pressure, with brisk movement, along the back of the chest, removing it immediately before rotation on the side. The first measure augments the expiration, the second commences inspiration. The result is respiration, and, if not too late, life to induce circulation and warmth. 8. Rub the limbs upward, with firm grasping pressure and with energy, using handkerchiefs, etc. By this measure, the blood is propelled along the veins towards the heart. 9. Let the limbs be thus dried and warmed, and then clothed, the bystanders supplying coats, waistcoats, etc. 10. Avoid the continuous warm bath, and the position on or inclined to the back. Litter for the wounded. If a man be wounded or sick and has to be carried upon the shoulders of others, make a litter for him in the Indian fashion. That is to say, cut two stout poles, each eight foot long, to make its two sides, and three other crossbars of two and a half feet each to be lashed to them. Then, supporting this letter-shaped framework over the sick man as he lies in his blanket, knot the blanket up well to it, and so carry him off palanquin fashion. One crossbar will be just behind his head, another in front of his feet. The middle one will cross his stomach and keep him from falling out, and there will remain two short handles for the carriers to lay hold of. The American Indians carry their wounded companions by this contrivance after a fight, and during a hurried retreat, for wonderful distances. A king of wagon-roof top can easily be made to it, with bent boughs and one spare blanket. See Palanquin. End of chapter 4、Chapter、five of the Art of Travel Recording by Stephanie Lee The Art of Travel by Sir Francis Galton Chapter 5 Surveying Instruments In previous editions I reprinted here, with a few trifling alterations, part of a paper that I originally communicated to the Royal Geographical Society and which will be found at the end of their volume for 1854. In addition to it, communications are published there from Lieutenant Raper, 
Admiral Fitzroy, Admiral Smith, Admiral Beechey, and Colonel Sykes, the whole of which was collected under the title of Hints to Travelers. They were printed in a separate form and widely circulated. When the edition was exhausted, a fresh committee was appointed by the Council of the Royal Geographical Society, consisting of Admiral Sir George Back, Admiral R. Collinson, and myself, to revise the pamphlet thoroughly. This process was again gone through in 1871, and now the pamphlet is so much amended and enlarged that I should do no good by making extracts. It is much better that intending travelers should apply for this third edition of the Hints to Travelers at the Society's Rooms, one Savile Row, for it gives a great deal of information upon instruments that they would find of real value. Its price is one shilling. Porters for Delicate Instruments in trust surveying instruments and fragile articles to some respectable old savage, whose infirmities compel him to walk steadily, he will be delighted at the prospect of picking up a living by such easy service. Measuring Low Angles by Reflection An ordinary artificial horizon is useless for very low angles. They can be measured to within two or three minutes by means of a vertical point of reference obtained in the following manner. Tie two pieces of thread, crossing each other at two feet above the ground, put the vessel of mercury underneath it, and look down upon the mercury. When the eye is so placed that the cross threads exactly cover their reflection, the line of sight is truly vertical, and if the distant object be brought down to them by the sextant, the angle read off will be 90 degrees plus altitude. Captain George's arrangement of glass floating on mercury, made by Carey, Fleet Street, London allows a very low angles being observed, but the use of this instrument requires considerable caution as to the purity of the mercury and the cleanliness of the glass. Substitute for glass roof to horizon. For want of a glass roof to place over the mercury, a piece of gauze stretched over the vessel will answer very tolerably for the purpose of keeping off the wind. The diameter of the pupil of the eye is so large compared to the thickness of the threads of the gauze that the latter offer little impediment to a clear view of the image. Silvering Glasses for Sextants Before taking leave of this subject, it may not be unimportant to describe the operation of silvering the glasses of sextants, as those employed on surveying duties very frequently have to perform the operation. The requisites are clean tinfoil and mercury, a hare's foot is handy. Lay the tinfoil, which should exceed the surface of the glass by a quarter of an inch on each side, on a smooth surface, the back of a book. Rub it out smooth with a finger, add a bubble of mercury about the size of a small shot, which rub gently over the tinfoil until it spreads itself and shows a silvered surface. Gently add sufficient mercury to cover the leaf so that its surface is fluid. Prepare a slip of paper the size of the tinfoil. Take the glass in the left hand, previously well cleaned, and the paper in the right. Brush the surface of the mercury gently to free it from dross. Lay the paper on the mercury and the glass on it. Pressing gently on the glass, withdraw the paper. Turn the glass on its face and leave it on an inclined plane to allow the mercury to flow off, which is accelerated by laying a strip of tinfoil as a conductor to its lower edge. The edges may, after twelve hours rest, be removed. In twenty-four hours, give it a coat of varnish made from spirits of wine and red sealing wax. It may be as well to practice on small bits of common glass, which will soon prove the degree of perfection which the operator has attained. Admiral Sir E. Belcher End of chapter 5